Welcome back to the show, everybody. Today's guest is a bucket list guest of mine, Joel Salatin. Joel has been on the Joe Rogan Experience, uh, I think at least twice, if not three times. He's uh, was the featured guy in Food, Inc. way back in the day, one of the first instrumental films uh, in reaffirming everything that I had learned from Paul Check in How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy and the old VHS Flatten Your Abs Forever video, <laughs> which... As many of you know, was the uh, the bait on the hook that got me into this stuff. Um, Joel has been a pioneer for regenerative agriculture. He has been outspoken on many of the issues around our food sovereignty, and just a great educator. He was. Uh, I finally got to meet him face to face at the recent uh, the recent Force of Nature event out at Rome Ranch. What good shall I do? And he was one of the keynote speakers alongside. My good buddy, Daniel Firth Griffith, who was recently on the podcast as well. Uh, I got to listen to Joel speak for an hour and then another hour and a half in his closing talk on the same day. Both of those were absolutely incredible. And if I could have just recorded those lectures and released them, I would have. Uh, Obviously not my content, but just incredible. And um, so we really dive into some of that. We did have some technical issues. So my apologies for that. This show gets cut short. Um using Zencaster online. It doesn't always go perfect. It's a lot better than Zoom and other things, but um, we hadn't finished uploading all of the backup data. So he just chops off. <laughs> and, uh, and so if you make it to the end of this thing and you're like, what the fuck just happened? Where's the rest of the podcast? That's that's it. So, uh, okay. Uh, there's many ways you can support this podcast. First and foremost, uh, share it with a friend. This podcast is fucking awesome. I can assure you. We got 40 minutes of this out of out of 60. The last 20 were great, uh, but we will run it back eventually. And the first 40 are just as great. The first 40 you're going to cover, we cover quite a bit of ground, quite a few topics, and quite a lot of, of important and really fun, good stuff on ways in which we can all uh, participate in better food systems. So um, share it with a friend. Leave us a five-star rating. All year long, Organifi is hooking someone up, and it's the best one. It's the best reviewer. It's not It's not a guessing game. It's not random. Whoever leaves the best five-star review on one or two ways the show's helped you out in life, uh, leave your Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook handle, and we'll be sure to get out that award-winning prize from the award-winning company Organifi. They're phenomenal. Also, support our sponsors. These guys are hand-picked. They're incredible. And uh, I've got a new one today, ancestralhuntingschool.com. These guys are awesome. You can use code KKP at checkout for 10% off. Hey, y'all. As you know, I'm a vocal advocate for making time to reconnect to nature to experience all the benefits of recharging through time away from the trappings of our modern lives. I've learned a ton from the numerous hunting experiences I've been on. And uh, I have not been on a, on a shit ton of hunting experiences, let's just say that. But I have learned a ton from each of them over the past several years and even those excursions which I don't which don't result in animal harvest which have been plenty there's a ton of value in learning the principles and practices you'll need to employ to put a hunt together the experience and knowledge handed down to participants in ancestral hunting schools primitive rendezvous will go a long way to reconnecting you with your primal roots and ability to survive in the wilderness like our ancestors did if you're seeking to expand your skills and curious about acquiring knowledge of essential hunting strategies and tactics along with tracking, basic orienteering, foraging, butchering, processing, and general survival, then I encourage you to check out Ancestral Hunting School's Primitive Rendezvous program. Ancestral Hunting School's experienced coaches will guide you through the wilderness, teaching you how to build shelters, start a fire with a bow drill, all while sleeping in a teepee at 9,000 feet in the heart of Colorado. This is awesome. There's a proprietary AHS curriculum, accommodations, chef-prepared nourishing food, survival skills, foraging, butchering skills, orienteering, tracking, hide preparation, and tanning, firearms handling and safety. It's awesome. Zoom calls prior to the rendezvous will walk you through how to get your hunter education card, applying for a hunting license, and scouting for big game in your area. This is awesome. You're going to learn so much. You're going to reconnect with nature and yourself as you acquire these skills that have been passed down for generations. Check it all out. Visit the website ancestralhuntingschool.com now to learn more about the programs and start your journey to greater self-sufficiency and expanded ability to handle whatever life throws at you. And be sure to use KKP at checkout for 10% off. That is ancestralhuntingschool.com. 
We're also brought to you today by my homies at Lucy.co. Lucy is a longtime sponsor. Look, we're all adults here, and I know some of us choose to use nicotine to relax, focus, or just unwind after a long day. Lucy is a modern oral nicotine company that makes nicotine gum, lozenges, and pouches for adults who are looking for the best, most responsible way to consume their nicotine. We're damn near halfway through the year here, so there's no excuse. If you want the best, you got to go with Lucy.co. I absolutely love using their products. You can use them on airplanes, in the gym, anywhere you want. Their pouches are incredible. And if I need a little boost just to keep me going or switch my brain on, it is an excellent way to supercharge the mind and the body. Check out lucy.co and use promo code KKP at checkout for 20% off all orders. We're also brought to you today by my homies at curednutrition.com slash KKP. Rise is a nootropic formulated by Cured's very own in-house clinical herbalist. It contains a blend of lion's mane and cordyceps mushrooms, rhodiola, ginseng, and broad-spectrum CBD. I absolutely love this stuff. Initially, I started taking Rise by Cured Nutrition because I wanted to reduce my caffeine intake. And even though I've floated back and forth post-ayahuasca, I've found that I, with Rise, can get away with far less. And also, thanks to Aya cleaning me out. But I tend to just stick to that one cup a day, whereas before, I used to have multiple. If I need another pick-me-up in the afternoon, I'll take another serving of Rise. You can check it all out at curednutrition.com slash KKP and use coupon code KKP at checkout to save 20% off. But this is a badass formula. It's got lion's mane for mental clarity and energy, cordyceps for oxygen utilization. It's used by many endurance athletes. Huperzia serrata, which is a phenomenal plant-based nootropic, and CBD, which aids in balancing the supplement. Many nootropics and focus supplements are overstimulating and create a crash, including CBD in this formulation, avoids this. It's got ginseng, which improves cognitive function and extends your mental clarity and performance. There's no caffeine, so it's great for midday coffee or energy drink replacement, and it stacks well with caffeine. So it's good if you do, and it's good if you don't. No jitters, no crash, love this stuff. I'm also really into taking Zen. Uh, Zen is a product that helps you unwind at night. It's got reishi mushrooms, ashwagandha, chamomile, passion flower, and broad spectrum CBD. This is really the thing that I like taking in the evenings, you know, it's post meal. I'll take this. I wind down while I'm reading to the kids on the biomat. It is phenomenal. It kicks on. I get nice and tired and I just drift off to sleep. Check it all out. That is C U R E D N U T R I T I O N.com slash KKP and use code KKP at checkout for 20% off. Last but not least, we're brought to you by the homies at HVMN.com slash KKP. I've had both their founders on this podcast because they're both fucking wizards. I mean, absolute wizards. Um, they really have a knack for human performance, and you can tell that they've been geeking out on it in the best way. This is the shit that I was starting to understand in college. Like, there are nerds, and I say that in the best way. There are nerds out there who are highly intelligent people that are tracking the same shit I am that I can learn from. And that's exactly what these guys are doing. They're working with some of the best nerds in the world. And some of these nerds don't look the way you would think a nerd looks. Both of them are fucking super fit. Uh, they work with another nerd, Dominic D'Agostino, who's fucking jacked to the gills. <laughs> and I've had on this podcast and uh, they're working with many of the best in this space, researchers, people that are working with uh, the best operators in the world. They have a massive contract with the department of defense $6 million contract with U.S. Special Operations Command. So these guys are training and working with the very best, and they're doing a lot of experiments. I love the N equals one experiment. So run the N equals one experiment on yourself. How do HVMN ketones actually help me during the day? Is it going to improve cognitive function? Fuck yeah. Is it going to give me more energy? Absolutely. Is it going to work in an endurance workout? Is it going to work in a glycolytic workout? Yes. Magically, this seems to apply to everything that I've just mentioned. And I talked about how this works glycolytically, even though it's a ketone, uh, on the podcast that I did with Jeff Wu, one of their co-founders co most recently. So check out that podcast. Also, Michael Brandt, we did that about two years ago. They're phenomenal episodes if you want to know more. But trust me when I say this, this is one of the most important supplements ever made. It's in a league of its own. Go to hvmn.com slash KKP and use promo code KKP at checkout to save 20%. This is just something that I take fucking every day, especially when I'm traveling. We just got back from Fit for Service in Montana, and I was running this multiple times a day because it gives me everything that I need to, to show up at my best. If I've got, I mean, I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. The final day I was there, after competing twice, after an ecstatic dance, after dirt wire played, after going hard to the paint for long ass days, on my final day where I had to coach, 
I did a 90-minute talk, an hour Q&A, two-hour breath work where I participated instead of guiding, and then I went back and spoke for another two hours, and then I did another hour and a half talk, and then I went to dinner and I answered more questions for an hour, and that was all because I had HVMN ketones fueling my brain the entire fucking day. Check it out, hvmn.com slash KKP. Without further ado, my brother, Joel Salatin. All right, we're running it back. We had a little little tech blip there, which, uh, you know, we were getting getting quite juicy. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not even sure the thread I was going off of, so so my, my apologies well, I, for that. I, I, finished, I finished talking about... Um, uh, about the the hu- the hubris and the humility that comes from you know from actually immersing in nature and growing things that it's it's not a game it's for all the marbles and that's and, right and that that's a that's a valuable thing to come into life with to understand life's not a marionette that I just uh, I just move strings around yeah and that made me think of you know millennials as this kind of wide ranging group but that the the general complaint is this idea of, of expectations that things should be handed to me. And, and, um, maybe it's, it's a woo woo thought or whatever the hell it is. And, and obviously it's a stereotype because it, it doesn't, it's not inclusive of everybody that falls within that age category. But sure. if you look at an antidote, instead of just pointing our finger at what the problem is, which seems to be par for the course right now, this is wrong. This is wrong. Instead of saying what's right. If we look at what's right, uh, that very well could be the remedy, right? When we're looking at, providing for oneself uh, everything that it takes to go in it, even if it is. I mean, one of the things that was brilliant, uh, one of the many things that you've said that was just brilliant on Rogan's podcast was if everybody had a, a few chickens in their backyard, that would, that would lower the carbon footprint tremendously because we wouldn't waste food anymore, right? And that would be recycling that carbon footprint back into the earth. We'd be, we'd be fertilizing our ground, even if it is just grass or trees. And, um, nothing would go to waste, right? We wouldn't be burning off in some landfill somewhere. And mm-hmm. just having three chickens, you know, and alone, like we raised, we, we got our chickens out at the farm, uh, started with 40 of them. We're down to 35, but um, <laughs> we raised them in our backyard here in, in Austin, Texas. And, and they were in our living room in a trough. And I'd bring them outside with my wife every single morning. We'd put them in the chicken rung so they could grow up outdoors. And every evening when the sun was setting, I'd bring them back in with a fresh, fresh pile of, uh, of uh, pine shavings and they'd go in and then at six weeks old, I wanted them to know my kids. We got a, a two-year-old and a seven-year-old at the time and our little dog. So I, because we're not, we haven't built our house yet on the land that we participate in. Um, I didn't want them to not know us. And so now they know us, but like that little bit was such a, such a, an awesome thing, not just for me because it was extra work. Like every morning and every day I'd have my regular work schedule and all the other things to do. And I had to tend these chickens who were going to die if it wasn't for me and my wife taking care of them. And um, the kids got to participate in that at a very young age. Something I, you know, other than walking the dog, like there's like one yeah, yeah. job for a city kid, walk and feed the dog. That's your first yeah, right. role and responsibility outside of making your own bed. But when yeah, you yeah. think about, um, you know, a, a group that big and, and you know, we, we're adding we're a adding hundred chicks and 20 ducks and three geese this summer. So I'm really excited for that. We're building oh, that a nice big coop. Yeah. And, you know, that's a lot of work and, and, you know, something that, yeah. that made me think of a, one thing that I really loved at your talk was you were talking about, you know, giving kids jobs, you get them out there and they got to go on the egg collection. If we're in our, in our high point laying a hundred plus eggs a day, that's a lot of eggs to, to grab. You know, that's not something that, that that's, that's adding a lot, especially to the adults and the guys that are actually, you know, doing the heavy labor of the land and things like that. But what a perfect job for the kids. What a perfect job. What a way, easy way to get paid, to get them involved, to get them finding out because they're not always laying in these perfect little beds we make for them. They're finding their favorite tree and their favorite little nook on the ground and their favorite little hole where they can, they can go out and lay their eggs. And there might be 20 eggs there. You know, they, that adds up pretty quick for them. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And, and, and to get, to get chill. I mean, there's a, there's a certain, um, uh, whatever, a, a reward there from, from your, uh, you know, from your care. Your, your caretaking gives you a reward. And, um, and so, you know, one of the best things that a, that a life like that can do for a child is just um, aff- affirmation of, of who they are as a person. Uh, you know, a, a lot of kids grow up now, unfortunately, I think not knowing who they are because they've never been, they've never discovered it through real, through real life experience, through real life uh 
so so you know, you gather so you're you're gathering eggs. I mean that's a wonderful it's a wonderful child thing. You know, are you careful? Or are you not? Um, uh, do I tend to be reckless? Um, you know, am I cracking these eggs? Do, am I keeping the nest boxes clean? Uh, am I being diligent about finding all of them? Am I leaving a few t- tomorrow when I go out? Oh, I missed two two nests yesterday. Oh my, that's you know that that's um, that's not that's a little bit negligent, you know. And, and so all of that character development, um, uh, when 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 we're successful at 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 doing something meaningful. It all brings us an affirmation of our personhood, uh, and 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 you know you you don't you don't affirm somebody just telling them oh you're a good boy or you're a good girl no they, they've got to do something to deserve you're a good boy you're a good girl I mean that's that's how you affirm that, that you affirm through deeds I mean and, and of course when we get older what's the what's the second you know you ask a person's name next question is what do you do? Right. I mean, we're, we're known by what we do. And so, uh, you know, my concern is if, if, uh, if, if we don't do anything, if we don't allow our kids and our young people to do anything meaningful and participatory in the adult adult world, because, you know, child labor, or because, you know, we think that it, it'll uh, jaundice them. I mean, we do, we, we have this a lot with, uh, cause, cause we, we slaughter a lot of animals here. We're, we're in livestock. So we butcher a lot of animals and, and, uh, uh, um, you know, people come out to the farm and we're out here, you know, dressing chickens and, oh, I'm all concerned about my, you know, my, my three-year-old, you know, seeing this. And, um, and, and actually I think it's good for a kid to understand that, 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 that life comes from death. Something has to die in order for there to be life, whether it's a compost pile and, and every, and, and bugs eating bugs to, to regenerate, to make new life, or whether it's, you know, uh, uh, dressing a chicken so that, you know, we've got, uh, uh, meat to eat. Uh, that, that's an, that's an important thing to understand. And also to understand the chicken doesn't come back to life either, you know? So maybe you better be careful about picking up a gun and shooting somebody because, you know, there's real blood, there's real blood, there's real death. And so, so this becomes almost like a an immune. I don't want to use the word vaccine, but 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 almost a vaccine a builder for kids, you know, to to impress upon them uh, the cycles of life, the gravity of life, the um, the eco- the economies of life, and uh, and you know that's a that's a va- those are valuable lessons uh, to to come to adulthood. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I was thinking back because you were mentioning that my first job was working at Burger King from 14 to Ah. 16 years old. My dad made me get a summer job and I was pissed and I was making uh, 425 an hour, which was minimum wage in California at the time. And it moved up quite a bit. I think it finished at like 615 or something like that by the time I I got out of there. But, you know, having a, a, a shitty job, to put it plainly, was uh-huh, something uh-huh. that was, it did me a lot of good. And at the same time, I was putting poison in my body. Whereas, you know, like my kids are going to have jobs that at times might feel shitty, might feel like a uh, hard work, but there's going to be so much more that they gain from that experience because of the fact that they do get to learn all these little lessons that, that kind of flow in between, you know, they, they're going to get, uh, you know, all the, the, the little things that you're not quite going to see. Like if I, if I overcook a burger patty or something there, no one's going to notice. But if I let an egg fall and the chickens get to it and they say, well, that tastes good. That's a problem. Now we got to lay some ceramic eggs out to make sure they don't crack open all their eggs and eat them all before we get to them. Right. There's, there's lots of little lessons like that, that can help a child when we're, you know, thinking of fine motor skills, gross motor skills, and nuance, right? Which is, which is left yes. the building. Nuance is gone. When we think about social media and, and the conversations or arguments people get into, uh, for some reason, we think it's black and white and nuance has just left the, left the table. But all of these little activities that we get to participate in help bring that back. They bring back the richness and the fullness of life, which is largely missing uh, in a, in a you know, daily modern lifestyle. Yes. Yeah, it is. Uh, as you said, you know, the, about the only chore that a city kid gets is walk the dog or take out the trash and, and it, it's not very nuanced, but on the ho- on the homestead, there's all sort of nuances. Uh, you know, is, is that, is, is that you about ready to lamb or not, you know? And so you're watching the, watching the you and, and, uh, seeing how close she is to lambing. And then when she does lamb, you know, you have that, 
uh, there's, there's, you know, uh, is the animal happy? Is the, is goodness, is the tomato plant happy? I mean, what, what does this thing need? And, and, uh, so, so understanding those kinds of needs and that kind of, uh, you know, service is, is again, uh, it, it's, a the, the, the most important thing in life is to feel needed. That's the most important thing in life is to feel needed. I mean, if, if you do any studies of like elder care and, you know, old age, th- the biggest problem that elderly people have is, is feeling needed. And as soon as they don't feel needed, then purpose goes away and, you know, boom, a, a downhill they go. And so, uh, you know, our society has built a, a, a culture around children not being needed. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, you had to chop firewood and help with the canning and milk the cow and churn the butter. And, you know, th- there was all this stuff and, and you were needed. And that and, and that needfulness created in you, um, uh, you were accomplishing things. And, and you were accomplishing things, not just being the, the top points getter on Game of Thrones. You were accomplishing meaningful things, things, things that other people depended on you for life. And, and, and so... So all of those skills, all of those philosophies are are nurtured in a, you know, in a homestead familial background that that's highly, uh, highly life foundational participatory rather than exclusionary. And it, 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 that's a good thing. Yeah. And I wanted to just jump back for a second uh, on, on the death piece, because I think that's something that Food Inc. did such a brilliant job of, of portraying was like your, 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 your T-bone steak that's in a nice wrapper at Safeway or Kroger's or, or H-E-B, it didn't start that way, right? There was this whole process right. to get this nice, perfectly cut piece of meat. And the sooner kids come to understand that, the better. One of the first initiations I gave my son was we actually headed out to Rome Ranch uh, in Fredericksburg. And I had him on my lap at, at, at 20 yards sitting in front of this bison that got shot. And we got to go and, and pray and love on that animal uh, in its final moments while its body was still warm and put tobacco on the ground and thank it for all, all of the, the nourishment mm-hmm. it was going to give to us. My, my daughter was in my wife's womb and she was being fed that bison that grew her initial printout of what her body was going to look like and how it was going to be, you know, uh, nourished right. through all the time, all the, the most, one of the most important times of her life for growth and, and imprinting on the, the genetic on off switches of what she was going to take, which traits. And, and that's such a, such an important piece for people to understand the death component of all this is one, I think in large part, if you look at like how a COVID scenario could happen, uh, first and foremost, as you said, we've outsourced our health, you know, that I don't have to worry about this. This guy's going to fix me in the white lab coat. I don't have to take care of my body. I can, I can let somebody else take care of that when, I, when a problem comes up. And then this, uh, you know, at the same time, we have this deep loss of connection to death. We don't witness people dying anymore. We don't hold them in our home through the last stages. We ship them off to hospice or we take them to the hospital and we're not allowed in until the final moments. And then, you know, they take their last breath. If we're lucky, we get to be a part of that. Most people, especially during 2020, that was, we were divorced from that experience and we've been divorced from that experience for so long that I think it's, it's, it's high time that we reintroduce that. And the best way to reintroduce that is through a deeper connection to our food, to understand this is how things, this is how things come to be. Things come to be through life, death, that cycle, right? And I'm feeding yeah. everything on the land. I'm feeding through death and fecal matter, right? I'm feeding it through the, yeah. the end right. products are coming back out. And that's the thing that's building the next set of what's going to come through nutritionally in all levels. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's, it's life, life, death, decomposition, regeneration, life, death, decomposition, regeneration. I mean, I mean, think about a, a compost pile is as good a thing. I mean, our own digestive process is a good thing. And so this whole idea that we can, that we can sterilize a, a, a life, uh, as you said, you know, um, the whole uh, death, the human death aspect in our culture is, is, you know, you don't see it, you don't participate in it, you don't do anything. And, and we don't, we don't do it. We don't do it with, you know, plants, we don't do it with animals. And so the average person grows up never having encountered the magic of regeneration. And, and, um, 
and and that's a shame because then you you can easily you you see the negative you see the you know the death and the problem but you don't see the resurrection on the other end and um and and that to to deny that to deny that the life yes on the farm we have death but we also have calves being born we've got little chicks coming we've got uh lambs being born you know you have eggs being laid you've got uh uh you know tomatoes coming on blossoms yes we we have dead tomato plants uh, in in the fall, but then we have new tomato plants in the spring that make new tomatoes, and so you, you see this whole uh, this whole cycle of 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 life, death, decomposition, regeneration, and and um, and that that engenders an ultimate hopeful view to the future, as opposed to well, all I see is negative, and the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Uh, and, and, um, and, and so you, you get to participate in this, um, you know, in this dynamic, which is really cool. Talk a little about, um, what you think, what would be your recommendation for people who still feel on the fence and are, and are in cities and maybe they don't have enough stockpiled financially to just up and, and, and purchase a small plot. You know, what would, what would your recommendation be for people like that? You know, and this is akin to, to, you know, the comment you made on Rogan's about just keeping three chickens in your backyard. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the question is, uh, yeah. So what, what can you do? And, and the truth is that even if you, even if you don't have any land, even if you're in a goodness, an apartment or condominium, um, you know, you can in, 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 in no more than a, than the, the footprint of an entertain of an entertainment center, uh, you you can have three chickens and you can feed your kitchen scraps to the chickens. You could have and then you could have eggs. Uh, you could have uh, a verma vermicomposting kit. You know they're only the size of about a about a little bigger than a shoebox uh, under your sink, and you could feed your kitchen scraps to worms and uh, the worm castings to you know to some vegetables or flowers. You can have on the patio. You can have uh, hanging. They, they now make these wonderful. Uh, uh, PVC tubes with pockets in them, and you can have an herb garden hanging on your porch. You know, a vertical uh, herb garden. Uh, you know, th- there are there are so many things that you can do. Uh, people um, people feel like, well, in order to do this, you know, I've got to have uh, a certain amount of land. I've got to have all this. No, 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 you don't. Uh, you can miniaturize all this stuff. And urban urban gardening, urban farming now uh, has gotten to a very sophisticated place. And uh, in fact, in my book, uh, Polyface Micro, I talk about how to have chickens and rabbits in a Manhattan, uh, a Manhattan apartment. Um, you know, you, you can, you can do this, you can do this on your own. Rabbits are real quiet. Uh, chickens tend to be a little noisier. Uh, and, and so you can grow a lot of this yourself. And, um, and so I would encourage folks that are kind of on the fence and wondering about their next step is dip your toe in that water. You know, e- even if you're growing something under LED lights, all right, you know, imagine a, you know, a, a, a grow bin with LED lights, you could do uh mic- microgreens, um, you know, something and, and just, and just start looking at some of your own sufficiency. Uh, uh, how, how can we do something for ourselves? I mean, even if it's a, even if it's a quart jar of, of mung bean sprouts on the windowsill, okay? That's highly nutritious. Uh, use your windowsill and, and jump with it. I mean, you go to uh, you, know, you go to Italy, you go to Cuba, and uh, you actually see um, um, gar- gardens, uh, uh, produce in uh, in gutters hanging on the edge of houses. So, like a imagine a glorified Venetian blind, a Venetian blind with with trays in it full of of carrots and beets and, and, uh, you know, and, and vegetables, um, th- and all that vegetation cools your house. So now you don't need an air conditioner anymore because the vegetation is going to cool your house down. Um, you know, you can put a, a beehive on the roof uh, and have honey. I mean, there's just so much that you can do, uh, with, with where you are. And, and I always tell people blossom where you are with what you've got. And, and then, and then as you develop the skill, the mastery and the confidence, uh, to go forward, then, you know, if you want to take that next step, take that next step. And, and if you don't, you know, that's okay too. And beyond that, I would say, um, do everything you possibly can to 
defund, and I'm going to use defund in a positive way here, defund the bad guys. Uh, so if you don't like you know, if you don't like uh, genetically modified organisms, if you don't like herbicides, pesticides, chemicals, and 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 and, and you know, a, a grass-fed, um, you know, a, uh, the whole feedlot, feedlot beef, concentrated animal feeding operations, whatever, then opt out, defund them. Uh, whether you whether you you get on the internet and you find somebody, you know, to to ship it to you, or whether you um, uh, cancel your Netflix subscriptions for a couple months, take that time and money and go visit your local food, you know, suppliers. Um, but, but develop connections, develop direct connections with your supply chain so that you're not dependent on that Costco warehouse. Yeah, that's, that's such an important piece. And, uh, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of work. It really can be just investing with what little time you have. I mean, that's right. really what I started with in my mom's backyard was I'm going to plant my favorite fruit trees, just my favorites. I'm going to plant peach, plum, and, uh, and we're just going to, you know, I'm going to nourish them. I'll give them some, some, uh, the best, whatever, you know, organic compost I can get at the grocery store or at, at the, the local place. And we'll see how they do. And that was the small enough connection to want to, to feed and for me to want more, you know, and I think right. of things like that, there's, there's always that ability that the drawing power of nature to draw us back in, but it isn't, it isn't that complicated. People think like, Oh, you know, you got to drive all the way out to this farm or that, you know, I, I brought my son out to Rome ranch several times. We'd go out there. It's a 90 minute drive each direction, but they've got a river. They got the Peter and Alice river right there in their backyard. And we'd go swimming in between and make a day of it. And we'd pick up eggs there like a big box before we had chickens of 15 dozen eggs that lasts a long time. You know, even as right. much as we eat that lasted a long time. There's a really cool um, uh, raw Jersey dairy farm down in Schulenburg, Texas. It's 90 minutes away from us, but we found uh, there's a couple of people that do delivery services to Austin. They charge two extra dollars a gallon. Cool. Take my money. You know, we'll go out there every now and then just so we can see the cows and, and see the little calves being born in the spring. But outside of that, I'll pay the extra $2 a gallon just to have it delivered to me. So I don't have to worry about making the long trek every time I need to get milk. There's little ways in which... Yes. You know, we can foster true community together and true relationships. I've got a buddy in uh, Bastrop about 30 minutes east, and he's doing meat birds and uh, pigs. And those are the two things we don't have. We've got cows, we've got sheep, we've got egg layers. So mm. we can trade and barter with each other and get the things that we want. I love his pork and I love his chicken. He's got great meat birds. And that's a way where we, we can work together and, and provide. And at my farm, we've got his stuff available. And at his farm, he's got our stuff available. So nobody's got to make the extra legging, you know, getting down to Lockhart. Yeah. You're, you're doing exactly. I mean, those are all, those are all the perfect threads and you've just nailed every one of them. Uh, you know, do, do, do what you can. Uh, so, so my kind of, my kind of three, three res, three, uh, ingredient recipe for the, for the city person is, um, is first of all, uh, get in your kitchen, you know, uh, uh, don't get convenience foods, uh, you know, get, get unprocessed, get a whole chicken, you know, uh, don't, don't even buy breasts, you know, uh, you can get a whole chicken. We talk about pricing, pricing of good foods. I mean, right now you, you, you can get one of our chickens, uh, uh, it's cheaper per pound than boneless, skinless breast at, at, uh, at H-E-B. Okay, industrial or, or, or HEB. So, so you know, convenience food and, and boneless, skinless breast is a convenience food. So, you know, uh, get get as as close to the real, to the to the unprocessed as you can. Save you a lot of money. So, get in your kitchen, get some you know co domestic culinary skills, and start playing around with it. And and you know what, you don't have to be perfect the first time. So, oh, well, what if I you know what if I burn it? What if I overcook it? Whatever. Well, well, what if you do? You know, we don't walk well first. We don't talk well first. We don't do anything well first. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly first. Uh, you don't have to do it right all the time. You, you start doing it poorly. That's the way. That's the way we learn skills. And then the second thing is to um, is to do something yourself. Just to just to to touch viscerally the magic of life again, you know, whether it's a, you know, an earthworm kit or a, or a quart of mung beans on the windowsill, but something that, that you can, that you can participate in the magic of life. And then, and then the third thing is to, um, you know, to source, to source your provenance from authentic places and, uh, and, and, and 
fortunately, today, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity in sourcing uh, more than we had, you know, 20 years ago, for sure. There are more and more people coming and doing the very kind of collaborations uh, you're talking about, Kyle. At, at our farm, we have a farm store here, and we collaborate with about 12 other uh, other people in the area, you know, so you can get uh, milk and cheese and and uh, uh, pasta and uh, um, chicken broth and um, you know, honey and maple syrup. And I'm, I'm just trying to go down the, you know, the list of uh, uh, kombucha, um, um, uh, ferments, kimchi. I mean, th there's a ton of stuff that you can get here because we collaborate with other, with other uh, uh, local farmers. And so we're seeing these collaborations develop um, more and more to create kind of, you know, the one-stop shop. Now, I don't, I don't think we'll change your oil for you and we're not going to probably not going to sell diapers, but, uh, but you know, um, the, the, the one-stop shop food idea is definitely developing, uh, throughout the country on farms in local areas. And it's much more available than it, than it used to be. And, and if you can't find anything, you can get it on the internet. I mean, shameless plug, you know, we ship nationwide. Um, we're glad to ship to anybody in the country. And one of the, one of the in most enjoyable, whatever, uh, feedbacks we get is somebody who's living in the city. They, they get from us and they've never had this kind of food and they get it and they, Oh my goodness, I had no idea it could be this, this different. And then about three or four months later, you get this email from them. I'm sorry to have to leave you, but uh, you know I, I'm, I've, I've found it here locally, um, and I'm going to shift to my local supplier. And nothing makes us happier than when that happens. And so, um, so you know, um, listen, if we're going to defund something, you know, let's let's defund Monsanto, let's defund Cargill, let's let's de if you want to defund something, let's pick something really worthwhile to defund, like you know, like like. Um, you know, like Tyson. Yeah, yeah. And, and exactly what you're talking about with the defunding is it's looking at the things that are wrong and then asking what's right. You know, you don't get stuck in the what's wrong and spend all your time online bitching about it. You find out what's right. And the closer yeah. you get to making that, the closer to you, literally and, and viscerally, yeah. you know, if it's, if it's right down the street, maybe it's not right down the street and you got to have it delivered, but somebody's willing to do that legwork to make a little bit of money. Um, but yeah, I was thinking about that, you know, the, that at that dairy farm, they've got some of the best honey I've ever had. And it's, it's 20 bucks for a mason jar quart of it. And it's so good. It's like, take my money. This is local. It's Texas. It's organic. Right. It's done in the best way possible. And I'm happy to spend a little extra there to get the best possible product for myself and my kids. Yeah, there, there seems to be a number of great ways there um, uh, to, make, to make it simpler and to keep things convenient. Um, uh -huh. and I, I, you know, I know, you know, polyface as well as force of nature, they seem to be great bridges for people to get the highest quality food into their bodies while they start to engage in these practices and find places uh, to go to not, you know, a lot of people will complain, well, I don't have that kind of dough saved to, to go in on a whole cow or something like that. I didn't, I didn't at Rome ranch. I split it with Taylor. You know, we went and have these on it. That's what I could afford, you know, and right. that was, that was enough to throw some, some goodies in the freezer and, and, uh, and, and sustain us for a long time. Yeah. That's exactly right. And, and you know what, I, I've decided that the, uh, the benchmark, you know, people say, well, how do you know, how do you know when you're talking to somebody that gets it? You know, what, what's the, what's the really litmus test of somebody that gets it? I've decided the real litmus test of somebody that gets it is, are you eating leftovers? Because if you're eating leftovers, it means that you probably got, you know, unprocessed material, you fixed it yourself, and then you save the leftovers. You know, the, the, the grocery stores now are full of single, single service, everything. Um, leftovers also mean you probably ate it with your family. You didn't just get a single service thing, pop it in the microwave and then, and then graze by yourself. Uh, you actually all sat down together and you, you enjoyed this meal together. And so, uh, so leftovers, uh, that's, that's a nice little, uh, you know, litmus test for our, for our listeners here uh, to, to know, you know am, am I in the game or am I still sitting on the bleachers? Well, how many leftovers are you eating? Yeah, I like that. We have a leftovers night and it's, uh, it's, it's nice because it's not, you know, leftovers the next morning where we're, if we, if we 
if we gorged or stuffed ourselves the night before, we don't have to go right back to it. But a few days later, then we'll get to see like this kind of the, the best of, you know, we have some extra stuffed bell peppers. We've got some extra, uh, some extra grilled chicken that we threw on the grill. We've got a number of other things that we can all just bring together. And then that's, that creates a newness to the meal where it's not like, Oh, I got to go back to the thing again. It's no, I have different flavor combinations the different things going into my body because the combination has shifted. And if right. there is something we're not going to eat again, it's because our chickens are going to eat it. They're going to gobble it up and, and go to town on it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. There, ultimately, there's never really any waste. Absolutely. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, the people that are looking to get land. One of the common complaints that I get is um, I couldn't do it on 118 acres or I watched Biggest Little Farm and they've got 200 acres. I couldn't do that or I couldn't do, you know, you guys make it so simple on your uh, you know, we're all actually only, we're doing a lot of regeneration on, on the hundred plus, but we only have like a, uh, we have a food forest and the chickens and kind of the birds all in this nine acres that's enclosed. And we're only using less than half of it. It's probably a three acre footprint that we're doing this on. One of the reasons was to bridge the gap for, for educational purposes. So people could see and actually imagine the fact that you can scale this. You talked about, um, micronizing what you're doing at Polyface Farms. But what are some of the, some advice that you give for people that are, you know, um, saying, uh, I can't do it as big as you, or, you know, how do I shrink it down? What are some of the, you know, what do you think is the smallest footprint somebody could go off of and actually be productive and provide enough for themselves? Yeah, well, certainly, uh, certainly pr- producing your own food is the place to start because, uh, because every every dollar you don't have to spend at the supermarket is a dollar you can save yourself and you don't have to earn that dollar. So a dollar you save is worth about a dollar 40 because you didn't have to earn it and pay taxes on it. So, so, you know, there's, there's a real economic as well as, you know, environmental and nutritional aspect to growing something yourself. So take your, take your grocery budget. What do you, you know, wh- what's the biggest bite? Start there with your biggest bite. Now, uh, for a very small acreage, I'm a big believer in poultry, uh, chickens, ducks, turkeys, that sort of thing, because you can do that on a very, very small footprint. You can do that, you know, 30 or 40. You can have a p- portable infrastructure. Uh, you can move them around your yard, and, uh, a- and you can do that on a very, very small scale. Uh, and grow all of your own, uh, all of your own uh, poultry. Rabbit is also a uh, very under, under uh, appreciated. Um, the, the pound for pound rabbits will produce more pounds of, uh, of, of food per square foot than any other animal. And, uh, and, and they're, they're quiet. They don't, they don't mess up the neighbor, you know, they don't, uh, they don't crow. They don't, you know, um, make noise. Uh, and so they're they're very quiet, and, and their manure, by the way, uh, rabbit manure because they are herbivores, is is not very hot. So it's perfect to you. Don't, you don't even have to compost it. You can side dress your your uh, Swiss chard and spinach in your raised bed garden. So now we talk about garden. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm a livestock guy, so I you know I get that. But 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 start you know do the, do the small stuff: chickens, rabbits, uh, ducks, even even quail. Uh, you know, uh, that sort of thing, get something small and that can be done in extremely small footprints. Um, you know, uh, uh, 10 by 10, 10 by 12, you can start real small. And, and, and if you, if you don't even have enough room to move them around, have a stationary, but if you have a stationary facility, always make sure you have a carbonaceous diaper. So, you know, at least 12 inches of carbon underneath them so they can stir it and you can basically have them living on a compost pile. That's really, you don't want bare dirt, bare dirt, not good. All right. So, so it's okay to have a stationary place, but make sure you give them a nice big carbonaceous diaper to be on. They can stir and it can make worms and, and, and good things for them. Um, as far as the gardening is concerned, you know, I'm a big believer in raised beds, uh, partly because it's so child friendly. It's easy to tell this is garden and this is where you walk, you know? So, so uh, raised beds are really, really good. And, and so then you become a fiend, you become a, a, a magnet for carbon in your community. So leaves, uh, kitchen scraps. I mean, you can become the, the dumping spot for all of this, you know, uh, lawn waste, whatever, uh, man. I mean, you, 
yes, theoretically, you can get too much carbon, but practically you can't. You just keep taking that carbon, keep taking that carbon, and, and that's going to build your soil. And you can have your, you know, you have your little garden beds. And a, a garden bed, I mean, literally a four by eight garden bed can grow a tremendous amount of stuff if you if you grow it through the you know through the season and you use um season extension you know with some cloches in the winter and you and you stack it so you've got stuff up above stuff underneath shade tolerant things in the low uh things that need a lot of sun up high and you can and, and you can um you know and you can get a lot of production out of a small space uh and 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 throughout the season you know a solarium on the side of your house uh, for winter production, we have one on ours, and uh, and you can grow stuff, you know, year round in a little solarium, and you can get passive passive heat to you know help you heat your house if you're you know in in a in a colder place. So there's a lot of of uh, symbiotic uh, things in addition to just food, you know that that as as you build these these microclimates and these season extenders, um, they, they they build additional you know additional uh, benefits and niches into your living. That sounds great. If somebody's got uh, an acre to five to 10 acres, what do you think would be their first thing after poultry? You know, when we're talking ruminants and things like that, that they could work with, or maybe it's not, maybe those are too small and they'd say, you'd say like, start with 20 as a minimum. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so poultry is certainly my favorite to start with, but then, then, uh, you know, then you can go to a sheep if you like, if you like lamb, you know, uh, um, lamb, obviously sheep are, are much uh, smaller. I mean, pork, uh, pork can be done on a small scale. Again, if you have a big enough carbonaceous diaper, you don't want a stinky, smelly place. So make sure that you have, a, you, you have a lot of carbon, some old junk hay, moldy hay, junk you can throw in there that can absorb the, the, the urine and, and the manure and they can, you know, turn it around. And, um, and you can actually grow pigs in a very small, uh, spot, but that you've got to have carbon. You've got to keep funneling carbon in there to absorb the manure and the urine and, and give them something to play with. Um, and, and then of course, you know, the easiest thing to control is a cow, uh, a, a beef, a, a steer or a cow is the easiest thing to control, whether it's a milk cow or a steer that you're raising for beef, um, but but that is the biggest animal, and they do require the greatest amount of um, of land. Uh, you know, uh, you know, one cow uh, is equivalent to seven sheep. So think about you know seven sheep equivalent to one cow, and and uh, in the herbivore line, uh, I haven't mentioned goats. Um, I, I'm you know if you if you like goat meat, then you know great. But goats goats have the highest um, have the highest control need. Uh, they're the, they're the most difficult to control. And, you know, they say if your, if your fence, ho- if your fence won't hold water, it won't hold a goat. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta really think about, uh, think about the goats. They're going to be the, the most difficult, uh, animal to, and, and they don't like, uh, they want to graze above their shoulders instead of below their shoulders. And so if you have some decent grass and things, you probably don't want a goat uh, because they're going to get overfed, then you're going to get hoof problems, uh, mastitis, prolapsed uh, uterus, different things, and so goats are especially good for you know for for uh, uh, brushy, weedy, difficult, difficult terrain, and so uh, so yeah, I, I I like the chickens to start and even and turkeys as well, um, and rabbits, and then when you go up to the bigger animals, you know. Um, uh, sheep are are uh, give you the the greatest amount, give you more uh, more food per acre than a cow, but they are harder to control because they take a little more fencing. Yeah, I like that. We 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 opted away from the goats initially. We got a I got introduced from from Taylor at Rome Ranch to Austin Dillon, uh, the regenerative rene- renegade counterculture farms. Uh, I'll link to that in the show notes if anybody's looking to get some really good high end goats or sheep in Texas. Um, but he, you know, he said, you know, having the little ones, I wouldn't have any billies around because they're they'll they'll find them and, and uh, cram them into the middle of next week, you know. So he's like, you could just, you know, bring one in when you need to uh, to to get the kids ready and get get that next generation on the land, uh, and then rotate it out, either eat it or or move it along, send it back. But uh, ultimately, it just made more sense to go with sheep for that reason, and 
the Rams are pretty docile. We just rotate them all together. You know, uh, uh, Daniel Griffith talks about that. The, you know, he calls it a flirt. The flock and the herd all stay in the same place. The livestock guardians guard them all just the same. And, um, you know, really, we got mobile fencing, which makes it, makes it quite easy to move them along and, and regenerate the land with higher animal impact. Uh, I'll re- resource a couple of good books on that in the show notes if anybody's interested. But um, I think it, it, it takes more than you think in certain aspects, and it's less than you think in other aspects because there's a rhythm to it that you can fall into, you know, that rhythm of nature, the cycles of nature. And, and as you pay attention to that, you start to learn from it. And then it becomes, you know, as you step into flow with it, it's less of I'm controlling this thing and I'm just participating in it. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. And, and that's why you want to start small. Uh, don't jump off the cliff. Start small and make sure that you have things to control. You've got a, that you've got a corral set up that you can get stuff actually controlled before you get it. Because those nice docile cow uh, that you bought from the from the guy down the road, when it comes off the the, the trailer, uh, it might end up in the next county in five minutes if you don't have a place to control it. Joel, that's that's flawless. A great place to stop. We leave more room for for another time. I'll, maybe I'll get you on uh, after your next book comes out. So I'd absolutely love that. You've been fantastic, and I won't keep you any longer. But Joel, it's been a long time coming for me. You're one of my bucket list guests, and I really appreciate your time, brother. Thank you, Kyle. It's been d- delightful to be with you. Uh, blessings on you, and yes, till till we till we cross again. Perfect. Take care. All right, Joel. Bye bye.